I'm going to do this evening, finishing up, obviously, Food on the Edge, I'm going to try, or try, tie in the whole team. So I can speak from the other side of the fence. So every speaker that's been here, vastly experienced, has achieved it all, uh, and they are our inspirational leaders. Uh, but I'm on the other side, and I've been here for the last two days, and I've, I've seen and listened to almost every presentation. And it's pretty much like them speaking to me, and it's about what I can take from it as a young chef at 23 who, who was just, just starting my journey in food and where it can take me. Um, I didn't come completely prepared to this, to go away with a, a set speech. I said, I'm going to listen and see the general themes of what's going on, and, and, and I've picked out about four. So I have them written down here, just to keep me on, on track. And what I'm going to do is, this is obviously a debate, I'm going to offer my opinion and my vision of where food is going. Um, some may agree, some may not agree, but again, that's the power of debate, and that's, that's why we're all here. Um, I think, first of all, what's very, very important is for me to explain why I'm a chef and, and why I do what we all do, because people ask me and friends who aren't in the industry, why, why? And I go, well, it's a good question. Why, why would you do 100 hours a week and never eat and never see your friends? And, and it first started for me when I was 15 years of age and I was lucky enough to be brought to uh, a fine dining restaurant in Dublin. And I sat there as a, a bright-eyed kid with my parents and had a five-course tasting menu, six-course even. And it was everything. It was everything from, from walking in the door, to walking up the stairs, to the quality of the carpet, to the walls, to the small door at the top of the stairs, to walking into the, the kitchen, copper pans, the white linen, the water, uh, sitting down, the service, the elegance, and then it wasn't just about the food. The food is obviously a major part of it. And I remember going through each course, obviously, thinking everything's amazing, getting to meet the chef at the end, getting a signed copy of the menu. And what I took away that day was the way I felt. It wasn't just, as Phil Herod mentioned yesterday, the, the pleasure of eating. It was, it was how I felt having experienced a restaurant, a fine dining restaurant at the top of its game. And I remember thinking and saying to my, my parents, if, if I can do something in whatever it is I do in work, that gives people as much pleasure as I had that day eating, then I would be extremely happy with what I've contributed in life. Um, and that restaurant was actually uh, Kevin Thornton's restaurant, who presented earlier, and uh, who I went on to work for. Uh, so anyway, after that, I said, yes, this is for me. Worked in various places. I won't go through the details. And the question still came up. People would ask, well, why are you doing it? And, and, why can't you come to the 21st at the weekend? And why can't you go to the match? And why aren't you playing sport? And you, you kind of sit in bed some nights when you mightn't have had a good service, or whatever, and you think, well, why am I? But I had friends who were working in offices and they were, they were doing all sorts of things. And they were constantly working, but there was never really any end goal or anything to show for it. They were, they were, they were working for money, for, for a means to an end. Um, but when I was in a kitchen working for people, I came in every morning at eight o'clock and there was a vast amount of raw materials, ingredients. And you pour out your passion and what you're taught and your, your skill. And four hours later, at 12 o'clock, you have what is essentially a piece of art or a dish um, to show for it. So it was that constant reward for the creativity which, which fed me and, and gave me kind of substance in what I was doing. And it didn't matter how many hours you had to do or how much weight you lost or what you missed, because every, every time you put up a dish and every time you sent a table, there was a great sense of pride in what you were doing. Not only that, hopefully the dishes that went down from the kitchen, wherever it may be, went in front of the customer. And they felt what I felt at 15 years of age, the first time I ever ate in a top class restaurant. And that in itself was rewarding beyond anything I could ever think of. And things happened, and I was lucky enough to, to, to go to certain competitions and win awards, but it was never about that. It was about me representing young chefs, first of all in Ireland and now all over the world. Um, 
And I'm absolutely humbled to be able to, to have an audience of, of such quality that will, will actually listen to what I have to say. And what I've seen is all the speakers here yesterday and today, they're not just head chefs or executive chefs or, or owners or, or anything like that. What they have is they, they basically transcend what they're doing and they turn from just a person who runs a business, does the orders, maintain staff, they turn into what I call inspirational leaders. Uh, and they inspire people, and you look up to them, um, and they're the people that get you excited when you get to visit the restaurant to actually see the, the man in action, whoever it may be. Um, so with that comes huge, huge responsibility, way beyond anything than producing food and people paying for it. Um, it's what makes, from my, in my opinion, what makes the industry tick over and reproduce chefs. It's these inspirational leaders. Uh, and the best thing about Food on the Edge was the access I had to all of them, both yesterday, today, tomorrow, uh, invaluable from all over the world. But while that's all great, there's no point being completely rose-tinted about what's happening, and there is a shortage of, of chefs. And, particularly in the UK and Ireland, I, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't actually worked outside it, um, less and less people are becoming chefs. So the question is, why is that? And that's pretty obvious, everyone can tell you why. It's tough, it doesn't reward you financially, um, it can be very unhealthy at times. But what I'd like to do, the, the team of Food on the Edge is the future. So instead of moaning about the problem, what is the solution? So you go back to two things, rights and responsibilities, be it anything in life. So the first point I have is the responsibility of today's generation, who are the chefs I talked about, the Tom Akins, those kind of people. And their responsibility that they have for us as young chefs, there has often been cultures of fear and intimidation and which adds greatly to what is already a very tough pr or profession. So what I would, take this scenario. We look in the next 10 years, these restaurants that are so highly regarded are not just restaurants where people go to eat, they are essentially universities for, for people like us who want to learn. Uh, it's also up to the people who, who do the figures. So there's always someone be it the chef, the manager, there's someone who is doing the figures and making the business tick because essentially you have to have a business. So say five years down the line, we see more restaurants and we're just starting to see it now. It could be a day less work, reduce working hours. It could be investing in two sets of chefs or an extra two for staff rotation so that there's a little bit more time and a little bit more balance in life. Um, not only that, from that side, it's about the chefs taking on young chefs like myself coming in, and it's not about standing in the corner, peeling veg for three months. Of course, there's a part of that, and everyone has to do it. It doesn't matter what job it is, you have to start, do the groundwork, and work your way from there. But it's the responsibility of the top chefs in the world to say, we need to take these people, we are inspirational leaders, and we need to develop them give them confidence, give them technical ability, and back them, back them to go on, be it onto the next restaurant or to do their own thing, with the confidence of, okay, I've, I've learned that, I can now do something myself. I was told, one of the first kids I went to, you gotta back yourself, because no one else is going to. Well, why should that be the case? Why can't the inspiration leaders, the chefs around the world, back the young chefs when they see talent? What could be worse than, than wasted talent, be it in any profession? That again is me as a, as a young chef, and obviously it's a rose-tinted view, and you could say, oh, well, of course he thinks that, and he, he, does, he wants it easy. But there are also responsibilities from us as young chefs, so we're going into these places. So let's say I, five years, we're going into a restaurant, it's a four-day week, there's a half day due to staff rotation, and the owner of the restaurant has invested in a better working condition. It's now my responsibility to go in there, to commit for two years, to show up on time every day, focused, determined, ready to work, ready to achieve a goal, to buy into the ethos of the restaurant. 
and to gain confidence. And as you're learning, you must work for the, the person that's, that's leading you on. It's the same in anything. So if I go into a restaurant, I commit myself. It's a lot easier for me to do if the working conditions are much better. And that's looking forward, obviously, in terms of getting, because I'm hearing it all the time, as of why would I be a chef, why would I be a chef? And it's a very good question when you think about it. That, again, is a very, very controversial thing for me to say. Um, but it's certainly something worth thinking about if we want to, if we want to, to look again into, into this great industry. Um, and education, because that's what I found. And I was thinking, what am I going to say? The, the big themes I've heard the last two days come up everywhere is education and sustainability. And that's exactly what that is, that, that blueprint of don't have a restaurant, I'm working away, I want to learn. You give me a little bit, I'll give you even more. And that brings me on to my last point, because obviously I am Irish, and the only reference I'll make to the competition I did was the, not anything about me. The proudest moment was when I actually turned around, and it was a, an Irish flag above my name having won. It was kind of like... We don't, we're not known for, for our food. We are known for our hospitality, which is something to note, because that's almost as, as important as the food, is that we can provide people with a good time. So now we just need to add the food element to it. So what I'm trying to say is you give the blueprint, better working hours, I give two years here, I give two years in Australia, I give two years in Singapore, two years in America, wherever it may be, and I learned how to cook a perfect piece of fish, cook a perfect piece of meat, a vegetable, a great sauce. And it's about then coming back as young chefs in Ireland. And if we want to make Ireland the next food destination and met, make a restaurant that people around the world say, oh yes, Melbourne, Attica, uh, Copenhagen, Noma, Chicago, Alinea, Dublin. If we want to make that, it's about going away, learning, but always coming back and innovating and instead of replicating. That's the most important point I, I see. Anyone can go away, see everyone else's food, see how it's done, come back to Ireland and replicate the same dishes. The difference, and what will make the difference in my opinion, to really put Ireland on the map, is the person that can take it all, come back to Ireland and say, okay, I have all the technical ability, let's think differently, let's think outside the box. Let's go back. Everyone has talked, every chef I've seen has talked about the future being in the past. Old cooking, old cooking methods. Across the board the last two days. So as chefs, with all the technical ability, all the learning, more chefs, the better working conditions, we've give and take. Can we now come and think outside the box and say, okay, there's bacon and cabbage. Break it down into its elements. What are they? And let's rebuild it in a way that's never been done before. And that's basically my vision of where I would love to see Ireland in the next 10 years. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.